Thank you. Thank you so much, Melanie. Well, I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I want to start very briefly by talking about why did I write this book. And to do so, it's important to go back and talk just a little bit about my background. So after undergraduate college, I went to law school, like a lot of other people did. Um, and having gone to law school, I became a lawyer. That wasn't a good fit for me. I didn't like being a lawyer. Um, and in retrospect, part of the reason it wasn't a good fit is I wanted something more related to taking care of people. I'm one of those guys who really likes to take care of others. Um, and uh, as I explored what else I might do and had conversations with people, I was heard to say, I want to have a flock. I, I want to be a counselor, but I also I want a flock like a minister or a rabbi or a priest. Uh, and then there's a joke in there about realizing that priests take a, a vow of celibacy and deciding to knock priest out of the list, but like a minister, like a rabbi. Um, and that led to, um, I like to say sarcastically a little bit, that I invented wealth management. I didn't really. Wealth management is really the financial services industry realizing that why just sell investments when you can sell investments and tax-related things and estate planning-related things, and you can put them all together and you have a broader something to offer. But in my case, um, eventually one of my uh, more strong-willed friends grabbed me by the lapel and said, listen you, you know money and investing and tax and estate planning and you can't figure out how to help people and get a flock? That's what everybody needs. That's what everybody wants help with. Get out there and just do it. So I put out a shingle as a lawyer. That's what I was trained as um, and have been doing that ever since. At the same time, I've been teaching at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania for 21 years. I teach in the Department of Legal Studies and Business Ethics. And what I teach most is negotiation and conflict resolution. This book is the coming together of those two careers. And it germinated out of my realization that my understanding of how there could be better ways to guide people in their financial lives grew directly out of viewing financial life through the lens of what would a good negotiator do? A good negotiator as I was taught as a student and as I teach them. And by the way, I should mention that um, before getting to teach at Wharton, I was a student at the program on negotiation at Harvard and so I believe I had the best teachers in my field in the world and by the way, that makes it extremely hard, um, excuse me, extremely easy to be a really good teacher and extremely easy to win awards, teaching awards. Just channel what the, your teachers did if you had great teachers and do what they did. The primary themes of, of this book, and I guess I should hold it up and say this book. <laughs> the primary themes are these. First of all, anyone can become a better negotiator and doing so will improve life outcomes. Investing and other aspects of your financial life are simply another set of negotiations. Applying the negotiation methods that, were, that are talked about in this book, the ones that I teach at Wharton, the ones that are taught at Harvard, they're taught at a lot of other universities around the country and now around the world, but applying those to the, the issues and the problems of investing uh, will get you significantly better results in your investing, in your financial decision making. Onward with the themes. Certain systematic problems arise as you negotiate uh, in a financial context, as you deal with the financial services industry. Um, and particular actions are called for if you're going to be successful in dealing with those systematic problems. And we'll talk more about them. And finally, that the fruits of improved negotiation uh, techniques in the areas of investing 
and dealing with your financial life are worth more than most people would ever imagine. I challenge you, I think they're probably worth more than you would imagine. And uh, in the final chapter of this book, I have a couple little charts to try and demonstrate that, and time allowing, we'll talk just a little bit about that so that I can try to make that point to you that it's well worth paying this attention to these subjects because, um, hey, it's worth money. It's worth money to you as an individual who is investing and dealing with your financial life. Now, a one-hour talk requires us to make some choices, yes? You can't really cover everything in a one-hour talk. And indeed, uh, you know, I hope students really get the gist of negotiating after 42 hours. One hour, a little more limiting. So in light of those time constraints, here's what I propose. Um, uh, I'm going to offer you a quick overview of the negotiation methods. Um, as they're presented in the book, as they're taught at Wharton and at Harvard and at other places. Uh, in light of the limited time, I, I, I'm going to only touch on and just review very briefly the economic truths at the end of the book that I think are fundamental knowledge if you're going to be any good as a negotiator of your investments. There's some economics you've got to know. It's not too hard. We'll touch on it. Um, I'll mention topic areas, and then I'll encourage you to go off and do some more learning. I want to reserve as much time as I can for what I refer to as the systematic problems that arise in negotiating your investments. These are the topics of conflicts of interest, asymmetric information, and a new understanding of professionalism that I believe holds the key to addressing these problems. So that's what I, I hope to talk about the most. So the, with your permission, let's begin in, that, in those directions. So let's start by talking about negotiation. So what the first part of this book is about, and I want to start by stressing, look, I wrote this book, I've been interviewed. I've been interviewed a lot of times. And a lot of interviewers say, oh, OK, negotiating. We know how to do that. So tell us in three sentences, how do you negotiate your investments? And what they're talking about is people's common sense idea of negotiating. And that's not what we're talking about in this book. We're talking about a systemic method, a way of structuring negotiation, thinking about it, breaking it down into its parts, preparing for it gathering the information you need, and doing it. So that's, that's what I, I want to just give you an overview of now, this systematic way of thinking about negotiation. So let's start with a definition. What is negotiation? An interactive communication process that potentially takes place whenever you want something from somebody else or they want something from you. That definition, as students quickly realize when they see it, is very broad and suggests that a lot of what we do is negotiation. My teachers at Harvard urged that a negotiation could be broken down into seven basic elements. So here they are quickly. The first one is alternatives. In negotiation speak, alternatives means everything else that we could do in the world besides this negotiation. You and I are negotiating. What if we walk away? What if we can't make a deal? What else is there out there for me to do? And of course, what else is there out there for you to do? If any of you have read about or studied negotiation, you know that the Harvard people went on to talk about isolating your best alternative. And they called it BATNA, the best alternative to the negotiated agreement. It turns out this is where power comes from in a negotiation. Understanding your alternatives and your best alternative, making educated guesses about the other side's best alternative, and kind of taking a, a, a pulse of who's got the stronger alternative, meaning who could walk away from this negotiation and be the less diminished? If I have a very, very strong alternative, I can walk away from this negotiation, and instead of being here, what I hope to get from our deal, I'm right here. I haven't fallen very much. 
If on the other hand, you, if I can make an intelligent guess that if we don't make this deal, you have a great ways to fall because your best alternative is weaker, then guess what? You need the deal a lot. I only need the, the deal a little. I have the power, okay? That's very important to negotiating. Later, we're going to find out it's tremendously important to applying negotiating to things like investing. All right, so alternatives are first. Second are interests. And what I always tell students is what you really, really want, what lies down below positions, you know, how much will you take? I'll take $10,000. That's a position. Below that are issues. What are the concerns? And below that are interests. What are we really, really trying to get and do? And um, I put it to you that you and most, almost, uh, let's say, all negotiators you deal with, they have a lot of different interests, right? And finding them out, discovering the other side's interests, being well conversant with our own interests, can lead us to making better deals, which leads us to the third um, element of any negotiation. This is options. Now, when I started studying this, I said, wait a minute, alternatives, options, they sure sound like synonyms to me. In negotiation speak, we need to lose that idea. They're totally different. Options are all the ways we can structure this deal we're working on. And alternatives are all the things that are totally external to this deal. So, options. I'll, uh, I'll trade you my peanut butter sandwich for your uh, turkey sandwich. Or, I'll cut the peanut butter in half and I'll trade you half of the peanut butter for half of your turkey if you'll throw in that Twinkie, right? Two options. Just in the lunchroom trade, we could probably come up with a thousand, right? Lots and lots of permutations. Well, of all the options, of all the ways to structure a given deal, some are better than others. Some um, get us closer to maximum value that we're splitting between us. And indeed, a lot of you in this room probably know this phrase. Some are Pareto optimal and some are not. Obviously, we want to create as much value as we can before we go about dividing it. A bigger pie is just better to split than a smaller one. So creating lots and lots of options, figuring out which are the best ones, and then finalizing a deal based on the best possible options, the, the richest, the options that create the most value, uh, and indeed, the options that actually get us to more of our interests. What do we really, really want? Okay, fourth element, legitimacy. I've taken to calling this outside measures of fairness. So the teachers at Harvard refer to um, uh, objective criteria. And my Wharton colleague, Richard, uh, Richard Schell, has referred to authoritative, no, uh, st authoritative standards and norms. What are we talking about? Outside measures of fairness. So what's an outside measure of fairness? Well, if you're going to buy a share of Google stock on the market today, what would you pay for it? Anyone know? Well, between 570 and 580 bucks. Thank you for that. How do you know that's the right price? There's a liquid market, right? And a liquid market is one way to get objective standards. But it's by no means the only way. By no means. So here's an example I often throw at my students. Um, I knew a, a guy who was uh, having his own house built, so he hired a contractor and uh, the contractor, uh, the subcontractor came to him one day and said, hey, how deep do you want the foundation of your house to be? I said, I don't know. I don't know anything about foundations. You're the, you're the builder. He said, well, I, I'll tell you what. Here's what we'll do. Uh, most people in this neighborhood have spent about $50,000 on their foundation. So we'll just dig until we get to 50 and then we'll stop. That's how deep it'll be. No good, huh? Why not? Anybody put in my language? Wrong standard, right? Wrong standard. What is the right standard? Obviously, what the standard we want 
is the building code, which is actually a codification of scientific standards. We want scientists and engineers who think about these things to tell us how deep our foundation should be. Not a price market, right? So <laughs> finding the right standards is very important. Let me also just say about um, legitimacy. No one wants to feel cheated or taken advantage of or treated badly. You don't, and I put it to you, the people you're negotiating with don't, and therefore fairness, legitimacy in both process and outcomes, in how we do the negotiating and in the deals we make is very important. It's important to us, it's important to others. All right. The next element is communication. Communicating well is very important and over so many years of teaching and studying and researching and thinking about negotiations, I have come to the conclusion that the single place they go wrong the most is misunderstandings, miscommunications, not quite getting what the other folks are trying to put out or they're not getting what we're trying to put out. Making communication stronger and better will bring fruit. Try to do it. Next is relationships. Relationships, important, no? Relationship in a negotiation, important? Well, as we study it, students always say, well, that depends on if you're ever going to see the person again. Are you ever going to see the person again? I usually end up by challenging my students that I'm not sure that I know of any situation where I'm absolutely positive I will never see the, the, the person again. It's a big risk to run. Um, and let me suggest this. There's a relationship at this moment in a negotiation. We're sitting here talking and negotiating. There's a relationship right now. There's a negotiating relationship that's bigger. It's the size of the entire negotiation, which sometimes negotiation lasts for months or weeks or months or years or even lifetimes. And we usually pull out one or two negotiations that have lasted millennia. You can probably think of a couple. So relationship right now, relationship for the, for the negotiation. Relationship beyond the negotiation, right? You know, do you negotiate with your parents? You do. You, you have a bigger relationship than that. You negotiate with your neighbors, with the people around you in life. You have a bigger relationship than just your negotiating relationship, and you don't want to lose sight of that. You don't want to damage it. In fact, what's best for a negotiator is, can you come out of it with the relationship strengthened? And let me add this. Every relationship has a potential relationship. What could this relationship be? if we steered it in the direction to get us even deeper, richer relationship, which would get us more of what we wanted. So keep that in mind about relationships. And the final element of negotiation is commitment. I put it to you that as you're closing a deal, you don't want an agreement or a deal or a handshake. You want a commitment. Here's some plain English. You want to make it as likely as possible that the other guy will actually do everything that he or she promised to do to, through the very end, to the, through the last promise that was made. Now, why didn't I say, and you will do what you promised to do? Because I figure you can trust yourself. Can you trust yourself to, to do what you promised? Um, and when you start worrying about how am I going to make a deal that they are extremely likely to actually do everything they promised they would do? You start worrying about that at the very beginning and throughout. All right. So that's seven elements of any negotiation. I now want to talk about four phases of any negotiation. And I guess I should, time for a commercial. I walk you through in the book, in the first part of the book, I work you through these seven elements and these four phases. Four phases of any negotiation. Um, the first one is preparation. Prepare, prepare, prepare. This is the single best advice about a negotiation you can get. Prepare fully, you'll do better. Know your stuff, do your homework, you'll do better. The second stage of any uh, negotiation is information exchange. Learn and gather everything you need to know and that includes all about the other, the other people in the, in the negotiation, the other side. Um, let's do this because I guess we have time. It's okay for it to be a little interactive. 
Let's say you and I are in a negotiation right now. What would you like to know about me? Anyone? Depends on what it's about? Okay. Would you, you, I, I, I'd suggest you'd like to know about my background, my ethics, my interests. You'd like to know all the information you can figure out about my alternatives and my best alternative, my BATNA, what I'm trying to do, what I care about. How about how I am as a negotiator? How I've dealt with other people who are similarly situated to you? Time pressure, as in the time pressure I'm feeling right now. Yes, good, time pressure. What else, anything else? Okay, here's the thought experiment. Let's say that as I was driving here today, my little mobile phone rang and it was my wife and she said, our little seven-year-old daughter Libby, there's something not right with her today. I am a little concerned and I've decided to take her to the pediatrician this morning. Would you like to know that? The answer is yes, absolutely. Why? It goes to my state of mind. It suggests I might be in a hurry. It offers you the, well, the students have sussed out that it offers you the opportunity to do one of two di very different things. You can either, with this information, take advantage of me because I may be distracted or I may feel tremendous time pressure, or you can offer me a gift, such as, hey, perhaps you'd prefer to put this off and not do this now, or we don't have to complete this now, or I can get you out of here early, right? So you can either take advantage of me or offer me a kindness or a gift that hopefully I will, either, I will repay someday and it will change how I am disposed toward you. Okay, I put it to you that if you'd really like to know even about my little girl's health, that you would like to know everything. And I think that's the right answer. You would like to know everything you possibly can about me. There is one problem with that, right? Well, well, actually, I'm skipping ahead. Okay, if you'd like to know everything about me, how are you gonna get that? Well, there's three le levels of ways. You can do research on me. You can go to your favorite tool, Google, and look. You can ask people, you can ask other people, you can ask people similarly situated to, to me as you are. You can ask my wife, please don't ask my wife. <laughs> but, um, and on the first level of all, you can ask me, right? You're sitting at table, at least metaphorically, with the biggest expert on the subject of me in the world. And, I'll add, it's my favorite subject. I'm happy to talk about it. But there is a problem with asking me questions. What is that? Anyone? Right. The problem is I may lie. And my suggestion to you is you take all the information offered. You take everything I will tell you. But in your head, you're putting it in two different piles. Here, this pile is, this is what he said, and I know of absolutely no reason or incentive why he would lie. And this pile is, here's what he said, but I can identify some incentives for him to lie, so be careful with it. But this pile that he may be lying is not worthless. There's a lot of data in there. It's just not necessarily all for the truth as it was spoken, right? Okay. So. You want to know everything. First uh, phase of negotiation was preparation, and you did that before we sat down at the metaphoric negotiating table. But the second phase, information exchange, now we're interacting. Now it's you and me, you and the other parties to the negotiation. Learn, gather, listen, ask great questions, and gather up all the information you possibly can. Be patient. Wait slowly because the third phase, Bargaining, as soon as somebody mentions a price or a term, what happens in a room of negotiators? Somebody gets back and gets cautious, and if, if it's playing cards, they pull their cards to their chest, right? The tone changes. So the big uh, advice for a negotiator is do not move from the second stage, exchanging information, to the third stage, bargaining, any earlier than you have to. Try to hold off as long as you can. It probably won't be long enough. Our tendency is to want to jump ahead. But finally, we reach bargaining. And you all know bargaining. It's probably what before this afternoon you would have called negotiating, right? The great job of the negotiator is to, tr to you're looking to identify what can I offer you that is cheap, easy for me to offer you, that you will have hold dear. 
And because you value it so much, you'll be willing to offer me things that are of great value to me. And perhaps they're less dear, less valuable to you. And we make those value-creating trades. Finally, we get to the fourth stage, closing and commitment, where I reiterate what I said about commitment before. You're looking to make a deal that works for everyone at least well enough that the other side says, yeah, I'm going to keep my promises because it's in my interest to do so. Okay? So those are seven elements of any negotiation as laid out by my Wharton colleague Richard Schell in his excellent book, Bargaining for Advantage. There's another commercial. And as reviewed and gone over and perhaps added to a little bit in my book, book Negotiating Your Investments. All right. Now, part two of my book says, okay, that's what uh, negotiating is all about. You can imply, apply this directly to investing. First of all, I have to make the argument that, um, that investing is really just another negotiation. And some people haven't liked that argument so much. So let me try to make it to you briefly and see if I can win you over. Um, let's start with this. You ever buy a house? Was it a negotiation? Were you absolutely sure it was a negotiation or a set of negotiations? Absolutely. No doubt about it. You ever buy a new car? Negotiation? It's, that's the most uh, famous negotiation in our society, right? Going to the car dealership and going up against that highly trained pro at, at negotiating tricks. Okay. So, how come when you go to buy an interest in an investment, an interest in a business. Why isn't that a negotiation? My argument is it surely is. So what are you going to buy? One one billionth of this company, Google? Is that what you buy usually? One one, one billionth interest? It's a negotiation. And these tools can and indeed I argue must be used to do well. couple other things on this. The fact that, the, that inv these investments are traded on exchanges and priced by liquid markets does not change the, their character as negotiations, but rather just adds another challenge, another negotiating challenge. Oh, okay, this is a negotiation about something that has this pricing mechanism. I urge you that you have to reject the notion that because it seems to be, and I emphasize that, it seems to be a take it or leave it pricing model, Somehow that's not a, a negotiation. And by the middle of the semester, any student of mine who said, hey, it seems to be take it or leave it, so it's not a negotiation, would get a scolding <laughs> or a bad mark or however it is I, I tell students to turn around, go the other way. Just because somebody comes to you and says, I'm sorry, this isn't quote unquote negotiable, does not make it something other than a negotiation. Okay. And this is what I said a minute ago, buying a house, buying a car, buying property, buying a property interest that you hope will appreciate, such as an investment, like a stock, or a bond that you hope will pay you dividends, and so on. Okay. Now, as quickly as I can, I told you, the first part of the book is negotiating. The second part of the book is about applying negotiating to investing, and we're going to swing around back to that, to the systematic problems. But the third part is some basic economics that you need to know if you're going to be a good negotiator over your investments. So here's some. Let me start with this. Economists know a great deal. They know a tremendous amount. Now, we make jokes. We say it's the dismal science. And we say economists have predicted nine of the last three recessions. And that's fine. And we take notice that economists most certainly do not know what will the markets do next month or next year. In fact, the most honest economists will tell you, I have no idea about that. But that doesn't mean they don't know a lot. They do know a lot. And yet, most Americans 
and people in the world invest as if none of that knowledge was known. And I'm going to guess that some people in this room sometimes invest in direct conflict with things that scientists know. So the third part of this book is a review, as I said. Um, and I think you got to know this stuff you're going to negotiate. Because don't forget, what did I say a good negotiator does? Does their homework, right? Knows what they need to know, not just about the other side. You need to know the science. You need to know the background of the, the matter you're dealing with. So here's a few of them. The markets are rational and price investments correctly based on what is currently known. Therefore, it is essentially impossible, more or less impossible at least, to beat the market. There are only three ways you can beat the market, according to this science. Through luck, which is random chance. Through uh, uh, insider knowledge, which is cheating. Through che I should do it the other way. Which, through cheating, which is insider knowledge, right? Martha Stewart did very well on that trade, but she had to go to jail for it. Um, and what's my third one? Oops. <laughs> Can't remember the third one. Um, pardon? No. High frequency trading, you cannot beat the market. You can beat other investors, right? You can jump ahead. You can front run their trades, basically. All right. And you've read Michael Lewis's book? Okay, um, but if, mar if markets price things rationally, which they do, more or less at least, um, and nobody can beat the market, what is to be done about that? Well, it is irrational to pay somebody to do something for you that scientists know can't be done, right? It's not a smart move. Yet, most Americans do that every day. And I put it to you that all of you are paying directly or indirectly, paying a lot of people a lot of money to pick individual stocks for you, individual investments for you, one way or the other. And that is something that is, scientists basically know cannot be done. OK? And except for random chance, that will not successfully beat the market over consistently over a long term. All right. Second economic truth, past performance is not going to help you. Past performance is just a reflection of random chance, just like if, I'm in a, if there were 100 people in this room, it looks like there might be. Let's say there are 100 people in this room. I want you to all, you can do this virtually. Don't do it, actually. I want you to all take out a quarter, flip it, and try as hard as you can to get heads. Good job, 50 of you got heads. OK, you 50, do it again. 25 of you got heads. Again, 12 of you got heads. Again. Six of you got heads. Again, you three, come on. That's just random chance. Let's see you three. Let's see one of you get heads. Who can get heads again? One of you gets heads again, right? Any skill? Any anything? The playing out of random chance, right? That's most of what we see in past performance. OK, another economic truth. Diversification is the only free lunch in economics. It is very valuable to you. Take advantage of diversification. The fourth economic truth that I want to deal with here is, um, let's see, historical, uh, oh, historical data, right. Um, we know what investments and markets have done in the past. This is an incredibly easy thing to study because most of the data is already captured and in computers. So, Dealing with people who are telling you lies or vague, making vague statements about past history is not a good idea because the history is known. Okay. Next important economic idea, critical idea. Costs reduce returns. I like to say they reduce them dollar for dollar. One dollar of cost will reduce your returns one dollar. Pulling out unnecessary costs when investing is of great help to you in getting better investment results. And in light of compounding over long periods of time, it is a fortune. 
Um, Wall Street turns out a lot of bad investments and they should be avoided. There's a list in here of a, a partial list, maybe not comprehensive, of things that I would suggest are bad investments that you should steer clear of. Okay, one more thing. The amount of money at stake by doing these things better, by pulling out the costs and so on, is more than you would imagine. Did I, did I promise you? Oh, all right, we'll do it as a game. There's a chart in here, put together by one of my students who's much smarter than I am and much more able to do such charts. But that chart asks, shows us this. I'm going to make it as a game for us. If you have a million dollars and some smart cookie is able to uh, increase your returns by 1% per year, either through pulling out costs or increasing returns or some combination, doing it more, more intelligently. A 1% increase per year on a million dollars. What is the saving? What is that worth to you over, after one year? Come on. $10,000. Good. How about after 30 years? Anybody want to play? Um, well, here's the answer. The answer is a question. You raise your hand and you say, well, hold on there, smarty pants professor. You didn't tell us the compounding rate, and we need it, right? The chart in the back of the book uses a compounding rate of 7%. If your investment is returning on average 7% per year, and you are increasing return or re decreasing cost, whatever it is, bettering yourself by 1%, how much is that over 30 years? Well, we are tempted to multiply 10,000 by 30 and get 300,000. But there we've completely ignored the compounding. Anybody want to take a gut guess? You took a gut guess? One and a half million? Not too bad. What? Okay, that's very low. The answer, as the chart in the, the book attests, is $2.1 million. So a lot of, <laughs> look at that face, like, you're kidding. You got to do the math. Okay, a lot of money is at stake. I guess that's my chance to say, you should read the book. <laughs> you should do what I tell you because, because it's not small, it's big. All right. Having said that and not having too much time left, I, didn't I say I was reserving almost all my time for what I'm first getting to now? Here's what I want to talk about now. The systematic challenges inherent in almost all investment negotiations. Conflicts of interest. Dealing with people who has, have interests that are in conflict with our own interests. Asymmetric information. The simple fact that they know a lot more about the situation, the playing field, what we're talking about, than we do. And the issue of trust, the problem of we may be in a situation where we have to put our trust in other people and who should we put our trust in and who should we avoid putting our trust in. I want to point out very quickly that conflicts of interest are not necessarily just financial. You understand a conflict of interest, a financial conflict of interest, right? You go to somebody and you say, what should I invest in? Somebody you're paying no less to tell you what you should invest in. And they say, you should invest in this over here because when you do, I make money. Basic financial conflict of interest. Okay. How about conflicts of interest over time? How about the, the, the one that comes most to mind is, I'm serving you, but every minute that I spend serving you is a minute I can't be out trying to get another customer. That's a direct conflict of interest over time. How about conflicts of interest over things other than money, like position or prestige or no, notoriety? And the example I decided to come up with for you last night is, I'm not going to use any names, but there are a bunch of celebrity lawyers in our, in our society, and it seems like whenever somebody gets in some kind of problem, I don't know, let's just make something up, let's say, it's crazy. And I know you guys are all uh, very confident in our highly technological world, but let's say that I took naked photos of myself, right? <laughs> and suddenly, they're all over the place and easily searched. Um, here come a certain group of lawyers, not to me, 
I don't matter, but to, to Jennifer Lawrence and all the others, celebrity lawyers, right? What's in it for the celebrity lawyer? They get paid, probably a handsome fee, and so on. But what about the fact that a young and budding celebrity lawyer, their career will be made if it goes to trial. And if it's settled quietly, which might be by far the best choice for their celebrity client, doesn't do much for the lawyer, does it? Conflict of interest. OK. Let's go to the second one quickly, asymmetric information. As I said, they know more than you, right? And they know more than you about the facts. They know more, they have more experience than you. They know the scuttlebutt, they know the playing field, they know the published rules, they know the insider rules. It's very, very hard to get a fair shake in that situation unless they care to give you a fair shake. So what are some uh, classic examples of asymmetric information working against us in investing? Well, front running, which you alluded to, uh, the idea that if I know what you're going to do, if you're going to buy something, it's going to raise the price, at least a little, and in some situations a lot. If I know you're about to raise the price, I can buy it first. And then when you raise the price, I have an instant profit. And there's Michael Lewis's book in a real nutshell. If I can build these very high speed uh, information systems, I can know what you're going to do before you do it, and I can jump ahead of you. So that's a, an example of as asymmetric information. Um, um, how about this one, though? How about this one? What about when somebody guides you to, a, to an investment, and when you go to actually make the investment, they hand you a contract that is 90 pages long? And you don't have anybody here ever done that, <laughs> signed such a contract? Right? If anybody's ever invested in a so-called annuity product, you probably have. That's a contract that your own lawyer wouldn't understand. Only a, a lawyer in that industry would even understand it, because it's full of Jargon, it's, it's totally one-sided because it's written by the, pers the, the company selling you the instrument, right? They know what's in that contract. They know what the deal is, and you don't. It's a serious asymmetric information problem. All right. And finally, trust. We are put into situations where we must trust somebody even though we have not yet built up a body of evidence to say this is somebody I should trust. Um, when we are lucky enough that we're in a situation where we actually can make a choice, how do we go about making that choice? These three systematic problems are huge, but here's the good news. Society has struggled with them for a long time. They're not, they may be huge, but they're not new. And I'm here today to argue, and chapter 17 in my book tries to argue as well that the answer that society has come up with, in part, is, to, is, is what we call the traditional professions, right? Medicine, law, and clergy. When you go to the doctor, a surgeon perhaps, you're in this situation, right? The surgeon could have conflicts of interest easily. If the surgeon were more concerned with how do I make the most money instead of how do I do best by you, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Lawyers, conflicts of interest, I'm a lawyer, conflicts of interest daily, sometimes dozens of them daily. And clergy, your, your relationship with the Almighty. These are the traditional professions, and they have been aware of this problem. Um, and here's what I think they have to, the, here's what I think the traditional professions have come up with. Long and serious training. Standards, rules, and regulations, codes of professional conduct that address these problems. Specifically, the codes among the many things they say are, when you hit a conflict of interest, here's what you do. And, and you do for your client, your patient, your parishioner. Carrot and stick, serious penalties for violation of the codes. Things like, you lose your license. And perhaps most significantly, in my opinion, very strong socialization in these values. To do any of these things, become a doctor or a lawyer or a clergyman, as I'm talking about, as a professional clergyman, not a mail order uh, 
uh, ministry, um, you, over and over and over, the training includes getting you to think like and take in the values of this profession. And those values include patients come first, clients come first, parishioners come first. The traditional professions all understand in their codes, their ethics, and their informal self-identities that caretaking and safeguarding of others is an integral and essential part of professional work. Now, I'm not so naive as to say, well, all doctors, lawyers, and clergy always put their, cli their clients first, and we don't have any problems with that. No, no, we have plenty of problems with it. But my argument is that the professions themselves take this on, and that when a doctor, a lawyer, or a clergy person screws up in this area, they are screwing up in part against their profession. They are outside the bounds of their profession. They are violating their professional duties as opposed to arms length transactions, sales cultures, where the, the, the codes don't exist or the ethos doesn't exist. All right. And I better hurry up. So here's my proposal. A new professionalism, a proposed definition of professionalism. I propose that what professional sh professionalism should mean is that a true professional is one who uses his or her ability and power, the knowledge, the learning, everything you've gathered, solely to advance the best interests of the client. And very importantly, if you're going to be a true professional, when your interests and the client's interests diverge, you follow the client's interest and only the client's interest. Client simply comes first. This is my idea and my understanding of a true professional. And my, my argument is we're making a tremendous mistake when we say, well, professionalism refers to uh, technical knowledge or experience or having done it a lot. I think professionalism in particular is about this question of caretaking and safeguarding of clients and following only their interests. And that's what we look for in a professional and therefore this idea of professionalism must be expanded beyond the traditional professions. Okay. Advancing true professionalism in the managing of other people's money would imply a duty of caretaking in addition to advanced levels of, of skill. Um, this is particularly critical in our society because we're becoming more and more a uh, you're on your own society. You're on your own with your retirement savings. You want to send your kids to college, you're on your own. We'll help you. We'll help you with tax deductions. We'll help you. Your employer helps you with a program, but you have to make the you have to do the decision making, right? So to abandon everyone to you're on your own and you're going to work with people who are not professionals, who are not meeting these definitions, but rather they're in a sales culture, is a tremendous societal problem. Um, and finally, though, so so. So my, my, um, my plea, I guess, is this. At this point, I'm going to argue that the financial services industry is not a profession. Rather, it is an arm's length sales-based industry. The great challenge for society and for the industry itself is to transform itself into a profession. In light of the conflicts of interest and asymmetries of, in, of information that are inherent in investing in money management, I would say this is a matter of urgency for our society as a whole. However, that's very nice, right? And I'm not the first person who came to this podium and said, we need great societal transformation and it'll probably take a long time and let's all do it, right? But one more thing for you is, let's get real, this ain't going to happen tomorrow. So what do you do? about your individual situation. And here is my answer. The industry-wide changes we have discussed here will not place, take place overnight. 
Indeed, even the first baby steps, the imposition of a fiduciary duty on all financial advisors is being fought vigorously in Washington, D.C. right now. To your surprise, most financial advisors do not owe you a fiduciary duty at the present time at law, which is crazy. It's what I just described as a baby step. And in light of that, it falls to the individual to take action for herself. So here's, here's the prescription. Here's what I think you need to do. I think you need to look for individuals and companies to work with who exhibit these professional qualities that I've talked about and who understand their responsibilities in safeguarding and caretaking uh, of their clients in, in their work. In this quest, here's what you need to do. You need to do a lot of preparation. You need to ask a tremendous amount of questions. You need to do your homework and know the subject area. Do your research. Be skeptical. Own your own power. This is very important because a lot of us mistake financial people for the people who tell us what to do and we just accept, like doctors and lawyers and clergy. That's a mistake. You're the one in the power position. In fact, to go back to a, a concept mentioned earlier, what's your best alternative? Well, last time I looked, there's somebody else plying this trade across the street, right? Financial services is the most competitive industry in our society. You got a lot of choices. That means you have the power. Own that power. Know well your best alternative. Do not settle. Keep shopping for the professional you seek. Um, get everything in writing and maintain lots of controls. Maintain lots of control. Do not hand excessive authority over to others. Um, practice your negotiating skills. Get better as a negotiator. And then understand that you're dealing with a negotiation with your finances. And of course, read my book, right? right? It is my fondest hope that this has been helpful to you in, you know, in navigating your financial life and that it will result in a richer uh, future for all of you. So with that, I thank you very much. I think I went over, yes? Is that what that was about? <laughs> I went over. Okay, but if those of you who can stay, anybody who needs to leave, go ahead. And those of you who can stay, I'll be glad to answer questions. And I think I'm supposed to encourage you to buy the book. And Oh, and if you do buy the book, of course, I'll be glad to sign it. And I, I'm not in a hurry. I'll stay as long as you want, and if people want to talk as individuals after questions, that's fine. So what can I tell you? Or what can we chew around? Go ahead. So uh, there are a lot of financial negotiations I can do, right? Car, house, my career, my salary, and like a ton of things, right? If I could invest my energy in only one negotiation, what would that be? I'm oh, sorry, sorry, if you invest? If I invest my energy in only one negotiation, what would be your top most thing you would have? Well, it's an interesting question because I, I don't want to be boxed into just one, but, but um, I think the point that I'm trying to make is don't give short shrift to the negotiation about your investment, your savings, and so on. Don't say, well, that'll take care of itself. It really won't. It's really worth the effort. It may not be more important than, say, your job or your future or figuring out how you're going to deal with your kids and their futures, but it's terribly important. That's my message, okay? Go ahead. So uh, if you can't beat the market and want to minimize costs, is the answer to just buy S&P 500 index funds and call it a Well, uh, a great question because you have to read my book. The answer is not to buy S&P 500 funds, and here's why. The S&P 500 is an index. It is not the index, and in fact, it's not the best index for you. It's not broad enough. It's only 500 stocks, more or less. Well, no, not the best, the biggest, the biggest. Um, and there's lots of research that will tell you, and you can read about it, not just in my book, there are lots of places to read about this, that you want to go broader. Remember about diversification. And so you want to build a group of index funds or other passive investments such that essentially you own everything. Okay? So you're on the right track, but the answer is not the S&P 500. Okay? Good. Go ahead. Um, I'm looking uh, at, like, I'm apartment shopping right now, debating, you know, potentially purchasing an apartment, and it's really, like, I feel like I don't trust anyone, which seems to be the correct thing. Like, I don't trust my real estate broker, I don't trust my mortgage broker, 
So like, where, when can I get, what, what should I do to get past that where I can like make this decision and feel good okay. about it? The truth about negotiation that I didn't mention is we always have to make a cost-benefit analysis. The book and my classes teach you how to do a big, important negotiation, and they say invest a lot of the resource of yourself in it. And so the answer I have to give you is, involves investing a lot of yourself and a lot of time you might not choose to do it. But the answer that I've been trying to present today is this. It's worth the effort to make a huge research project out of finding particularly the realtor, the one in a million realtors in New York who really behaves like a professional, who really, through re and you have to find this through reputation and through people who know them, or perhaps through personal contact, but someone who will really do as I said of a professional, who will say, you're my client, you come first, and I don't have to make maximum money off you because if you go away saying, this is the best realtor in New York and tell everyone who you know, I'll do just fine in my career, okay? So the answer is negotiate it, like a real negotiator. Negotiate it means do your research, do your finding out, you know, suss out the people, learn, learn, learn. Who has the baton in that situation though? Because like there's a million buyers, but there's a million brokers too. Well, the answer to baton analysis, and I really didn't have time to do baton, baton it takes me a whole three hour lecture, but the answer to baton analysis is you always have a baton and they always have a baton. You always have an answer to this question. After I've done all my research and really examined my alternatives and really thought hard about which is the best one, I always have an answer. What will I do after the research knowing? What will I actually do? So what will you actually do? Find someone else or not find Right, right. And if you're buying an apartment, obviously one of the things, one of the things I didn't talk about but I want you to read the book and see about is strengthening your BATNA. You can always strengthen your BATNA. The simple solution on strengthening your BATNA is um, know three places you want to buy and then knowing that if I can't reach a deal on this one because they're being jerks and they're being New York Realty people, I can buy this one and I only fall this far. Okay? Good. Sure. What's your opinion of robo-advisors, which is <laughs> robo -advisors. more popular? Well, as you could probably guess from my, my lecture, I think uh, work with somebody who behaves like this true professional I'm talking about is incredibly valuable to you. So let me say this. I think robo-advisors, um, let me back up a minute. The word financial advisor, what does it mean? Well, I give a whole lecture, another lecture about it doesn't really mean much, but there's a lot of confusion in American life and financial life because an awful lot of people call themselves financial advisors and what they are is investment advisors. That's even how they're regulated, just by investments. Robo may be able to do a reasonably good job of choosing an investment portfolio for you. There's a whole lot more to your financial life, and I don't know that Robo can do anything with it. So the answer is perhaps just for investments, maybe it's, I, I, don't, I, I don't have a full opinion, it's just coming. For a full guidance with your financial life, it's going to fall far short. Have you heard of personal capital? No, I, I haven't tried to keep track of all of them. Uh, they're, they're springing up like weeds. Yeah, what's interesting about a decent new one is like personal capital. It's a robo advisor, plus you get assigned to a live person to kind of manage your books. Okay, um, if it was my two point one million dollars, and if that's just what you will save, that's not. Believe it or not, you guys, everybody in the room looks pretty young, with one or two exceptions. We're talking about tens and tens of millions of dollars when you're old because of inflation and so on. We're talking about a lot of money. I wouldn't, I wouldn't work with somebody who some robot assigned me. Part of the message of the book is you want to do your homework and find somebody who's really superb and professional for you, and, and it's worth it. Um, what about if you're, if you're worried about the ethics of your investment? I mean, buying a, buying a, broad, buying a big broad in every place is fine. Probably investing in you know, child prostitution in Thailand. Yeah, so you, you're talking about what the industry calls uh, socially responsible investing, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, there are a lot of choices out there, um, and some of them are good and some of them are not, so you're going to run into the same problems. But it exists and it's there for you. But unfortunately, of course, it's not perfect. The way it works, the way it starts to work is um, investment choosers work with screens. So lists are made of what they will not invest in and they invest in the rest. Some are better than others. My advice would be, in light of efficient markets, you probably just want to build your screen and invest in everything else. 
and there, there are companies that will do that for you. Okay? Other questions? Thoughts? Criticisms? No? Um, there is a saying that um, irrespective of whether you invest in real estate or stocks or anywhere, just put somewhere, it will eventually over like 20, 30 years, it grows at about the same rate as um, the cream. Right, no. No, that, that, that question goes to, to my point about the history is known, and you can research it. What you will find is real estate does not return what common stocks do over long periods. Look, let's, let's take one minute and, and talk about what is a stock. A stock is an ownership interest in a company. And what is a company? A company is the coming together of people, machines, and capital under our laws for solely one purpose. It's Hopefully it's a little broader than one purpose, but our laws say for one purpose, to try to make money, okay? They do. Not all of them do. Some fail, some do poorly, but on average, they make money. And don't forget, what I'm advocating involves you're owning essentially everything. So your broad, broad portfolio of everything of stocks is going to make money. It's going to make the return that companies make on average. And it turns out, that common stocks, this diversified common stocks, is probably the best investment you can make. It, on average, it will do better than real estate, because what is real estate? Real estate's sitting there and it collects rents. But companies, if there's great real estate to be had in New York, you know who you're competing with to buy it? Some real estate company. You can own stock, you can become an owner of that real estate company. Okay? Good? You're, you're calling time on me, good. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Good.